Today, we will be discussing the five keys to interpretation. The psalmist prayed, give me understanding that I may observe thy law and keep it with all my heart. He was knocking on the door of interpretation. The psalmist realized that apart from understanding the meaning of the text, there could be no application of the word to his life. Conversely, once the spirit opened the door of insight, he was prepared to act on what God had said. The question is on today, are we prepared to act on what God has said? This is your reason for coming to scripture. We want our lives to be changed. We come to scripture so that we can learn more about God so that he can reveal more about us. If we want to have a life-changing experience, let's get ready for action. Because God always opens a door to one who knocks for that reason. So let's get started on today. God bless let's you. Let's look at content. There is a direct cause and effect relationship between content and meaning. The content of a passage is the raw material, the database with which you will interpret the text. Remember to look for terms, structure, literary form, and atmosphere. You ask a series of penetrating practical questions. Who, what, where, when, why, wherefore. You looked for things that are emphasized, repeated, related, alike, unalike, and true to life. In short, you have barraged the text with a variety of strategies aimed at answering the question, what do I see? If you have done your homework well, you will have uncovered the content of the passage. In other words, you've answered the question. You know what the author is saying. That is why I say, the more time you spend in observation, the less time you will have in interpretation and the more accurate your results will be. And understand, the less time that you spend in observation, the more time that you will have to spend in interpretation and your results will be less accurate. So whatever you do in observation will provide the basic content out of which you will interpret the meaning of the text. But don't stop there. God has provided four more keys to help you unlock his word. Let's look at context. Ask yourself, what do we mean by the term context? The term context refers to what comes before and what comes after the text. Understand that there are several kinds of context. Each one gives a different slant on whatever passage you are considering. Let's look at literary context. In the book of Acts, chapter one, verse eight, is an illustration of literary context. That is the words before and after verse number eight. The literary context of any verse is the paragraph 
of which it is a part. The section of which that paragraph is a part and the book of which that section is a part. And given the unity of scripture, the ultimate context is the entire Bible. Next, let us look at historical context. In other words, when is this taking place? And this is key in our Bible study. Where does this passage fit in history? What else was taking place in the world at this time? What are some of the social, political, and technological influences on the writer and on those whom he was writing? Next, we look at cultural context. Culture has a powerful influence on all forms of communication. And the cultures in the biblical times had a profound effect on the creation of the Bible. So the more you know about ancient cultures, the more insight you'll have into the text. Next, let's look at geographical context. Geography is a fascinating subject that is incredibly relevant to the interpretation of scripture. For instance, in Mark chapter four, we find the miracle of the stilling of the storm. And I point out the geographic features around the Sea of Galilee that bring about storms like this. Knowing this information lends tremendous relevance and realism to Mark's account. It also gives us a clue on how violent that particular storm must have been. It terrified the fishermen who had seen a lifetime of storms on that lake. Investigating the geographical context answers questions such as, what was the terrain like? What topographic features made this region unique? What was the weather like? How far was this town from places mentioned in the text? What were the transportation routes for these people? What size is this city? What was the layout of this town? What was this lo location known for? Next, we'll look at theological context. The question here is what did the author know about God? What was the relationship of his readers to God? How did the people worship him at that point? How much scripture did the writer and the audience have access to? What other religions and worldviews were competing for influence? Also, where does this passage fit in the unfolding of scripture? You see, the Bible was not just dropped out of the sky as a finished work. It took thousands of years to put the Bible together. And during that time, God revealed more and more of his message to the authors. So it is important to locate your passage in the flow of scripture. Understand, if you are studying Noah in Genesis, then you know that Noah 
comes before the Ten Commandments. Noah comes before the Sermon on the Mount. And Noah comes before John 3.16. In fact, Noah didn't have a scrap of biblical text to work with. So what does that tell you when you read that Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord in Genesis chapter 6 verse 8? Next, we are going to talk about comparison. But before we jump in to discussing comparison, I want you to understand clearly that private interpretation never meant that individuals have a right to distort the text. We don't have a right to mess up the interpretation of the biblical text. With the right to private interpretation comes the responsibility of accurate interpretation. Private interpretation gives us a license to interpret the text, but never to distort the text. So as we look at comparison, in comparison, we compare scripture with scripture. And that offers us a great sense of safety because the greatest interpreter of scripture is scripture itself. You very rarely have to go outside the Bible to explain anything in the Bible. The more you compare scripture with scripture, the more meaning of the Bible becomes apparent. One of the most efficient tools that we could use in the comparison process is a concordance. Here, we have the new Strong's expanded, exhaustive concordance of the Bible. This is one of the best tools you could use in your Bible study. We also have these tools readily accessible to us online. One of the greatest tools that I use and I tell my Bible students to use is Bible Gateway Dot com. But every Bible studier should have some type of concordance that they use to aid in the Bible study process. But when we talk about comparison, comparison points to a great need for us using a concordance. A concordance is a tool that enables you to chase down terms and concepts from one book of the Bible to the next. Using a concordance, you can put together things that appear isolated in the text and they take on greater meaning in relation to each other. Let me give you Webster's definition of a concordance. A concordance is an alphabetical list of the principal words used in a book or body of work, listing every instance of each word with its immediate context. A biblical concordance is a concordance or verbal index to the Bible. A simple form lists biblical words alphabetically with indications to enable the inquirer to find the passages of the Bible where the words occur. Now let's discuss culture. You have to see the biblical text against the correct background with the correct light shining on it. You have to have it this way in order to capture an accurate meaning. We discussed the importance of context in terms of the text 
of scripture. We must pay attention to what comes before and what comes after the passage that we are studying. In the same way, we have to pay attention to the culture and the historical context and you have to pay attention to the factors that led to the writing of the passage, the influence they had on the text and what happened as a result of the message. Now, let's look at consolation. Consolation involves the use of secondary resources. These secondary resources can help shed more light on the biblical text and they can help us make more sense out of what we are looking at. Understand that we never want to become arrogant in the Bible study process by thinking that we have all the answers. The truth of the matter is others have come before us and some of them have left valuable helps to aid us in the Bible study process. And we can use those resources to better understand the text. But let me hit you with this one. Never forget the order. First, we must look at scripture and then the secondary resources. What are you saying, Pastor Mosley? We are to read scripture before we look at something somebody else has written. To go to the secondary helps without even consulting the Bible gives a small place to the word of God. That is why the first thing you need before you ever obtain any other resource is a good study Bible. And once you have a good study Bible, you can begin to add to your library. But make sure before you start to add secondary resources to investigate the author's to make sure that these authors are biblically sound. And once you have that Bible that you are comfortable with, you add the helps such as the concordance, a Bible dictionary, a Bible handbook, Atlases, yes, learn how to use the maps that are in your Bibles and Bible commentaries. And like we stated before, concordances next to a good study Bible is probably one of the best tools you can have. As we discussed a concordance is an index to the Bible. It lists all the words of the text alphabetically with references for where they appear along with a few surrounding words to give some context. And that is what we desire. Understand that there are many profitable uses for your concordance. One of the most common is word studies, and I love word studies, but word studies can really illuminate the text for you. A concordance can also help you locate passages when you cannot remember its reference. So as we conclude this session of Digiversity, I want you to understand that you can become a good 
biblical detective. All you have to do is master this process and understand that as you grow, this process will grow and you will always reflect on these helps as you engage the biblical text. So remember, these are some of the helps that you can use to make you a better biblical detective, a concordance, Bible dictionary, a good Bible handbook, atlases, learn how to read the maps in your Bible. And last but not least, Bible commentaries. It is my prayer that these classes are aiding you to become a more efficient Bible student. If you have any questions, any concerns, or any anxieties, feel free to reach out to me at pastorhmbc at gmail.com. Have a blessed day. God bless you.